Hi all, this is Haley Cronquist, long-term uh, policy attorney at the Long-Term Care Com Community Coalition. Welcome to today's program. Um, the Long-Term Care Community Coalition is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to improving care and quality of life for the elderly and adult disabled in long-term care facilities. Uh, what we do, we do policy research and analysis, systems advocacy, public education, and we are also the home to two local long-term care ombudsman programs here in New York. Today's webinar is focused on resident-centered dining. It's called the Garden of Eaton, setting the table for resident-centered dining. And we are so pleased to have Rebecca Priest and Linda McCoy. Um, they are going to do uh, introductions for themselves, so I'll just kind of leave it at that. But we're really looking forward to it. It's a really timely subject, especially with the holidays here. Um, everyone's focused on eating, at least I am. <laughs> so um, we're really looking forward to today's program. And I will hand it off to them to get started. Thank you so much, Haley. I'm excited to be here with Linda McCoy. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna just pull up my slides for you all. It'll take me two seconds. And there we are. All right. So uh, we wanted to talk with you all about exciting um, resident-centered or even resident-directed dining together. Um, and I, Lynn, is it okay if I introduce you? Absolutely, and I will turn around to then introduce you. Fabulous. So Lynn and I met um, a good long while ago when we were both working at this organization that you see on the right-hand side of the slides here, St. John's up in Rochester, New York. Uh, she is an amazing registered dietitian and visionary of really resident-directed dining services. Um, and that organization, when we were working there, served 475 elders. Uh, and together, she, um, she and I helped to construct and um, build from the ground up community-based greenhouse homes, which are off campus that serve 20 elders. Linda has 20 plus years of dining and dietary leadership experience, and she is committed to supporting elders' desires and empowering team members to make food meaningful and a lot of fun. I think we're going to have a lot of fun today because um, whenever Linda's there, we always say it's like a portable party. So Lynn, thanks for being with me today. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> that was so nice, Rebecca. Um, oh, yeah, Rebecca and I started together years ago at St. John's, as she said, and um, at the time she was working as a social worker in our rehab unit. Um, and again, it has grown tremendously in kind of her career since then. Um, she is a licensed nursing home administrator and also works for um, the greenhouse as a project coach. Um, again, same type of thing as myself, 20 plus years supporting elders, um, advocating for them to make choices, um, advocating for care staff, um, and making it a place where people wanna call it home. Um, not that I moved into a nursing home, but I moved into my home. Um, and so, um, again, it's been a pleasure working with you and I'm grateful that you've asked me to join in on this today. Yeah, here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk a lot about food, which is one of Linda's favorite topics. Um, <laughs> and I like talking to her. So the first thing we really wanted to connect with um, you all on is really important and tactical ways that you can listen to the elders that are in the organizations that you're connected with um, in whatever way that you're connected. So what are some ways that we can engage collaborative planning around making food fun and meaningful? So we're going to talk about some of those. Then we're going to talk through some of our experience in um, making dining policy and food policy and practices that really make food available 24-7 for elders. Um, and you can do it even in a big place or a tiny place. No matter where you are, there's steps that you can take. So we hope to share some tactical solutions for you all. We're really going to look at a little bit about whole food supplements um, and keeping accessible pantries and really processes for getting people's preferences. It's a lot of alliteration in that little sentence. Uh, then we're going to talk about making food fun 
and really talking about engaging food and dining experience beyond nursing staff. How do you link families and um, social work and activities and the whole robust group of people that work in long-term care to be a part of it in a way that works for people. And then last but not least, we'll kind of talk a little bit about the importance of connecting beyond just actual food and how do you help support that? So we're looking forward to um, having those conversations with you all today. It is hard to do the chat and to do the webinar. So if you have questions, we'll make sure that we touch base on them at the end. Um, I just wanted to make sure that, and if there's anything in the chat that Haley or Richard see that you wanna bring up, please feel free to do so. So Lynn, um, we wanted to start kind of talking about what are some ways that we can listen to elders. And when you and I worked together and I was the administrator, um, and then in operations, one of the things I loved that you did was really focused with your dining and dietitian team on listening to elders and figuring out what kind of food people liked, when they liked it, and why they liked it. Can you just share a little bit more about like why you did that and how you did it? So food is such a valuable part of people's everyday life. And I think sometimes we take it for granted. Um, you know, the busier we get these days, the more convenience we move towards, right? But for our folks that are living in long-term care, um, they're used to a much different dining experience. Um, they used to sit around the table with one another and have those conversations. Um, and so, there's a lot of memories and rituals and traditions that come along with the food. Um, and we need to tap into that because these residents are moving in and they're going to be living with us. And we need to make them feel like this is their home, that they're happy with where they're at. So it's starting to have the conversations with them. Um, and it's simple. It's a simple way to start. Um, we, um, and I think it's in the chat, I did put in a sample of a kind of a likes and a dislikes form for um, people to use to get you started, but it's really simple to just come in and introduce yourself to a new resident. Hi, I'm Linda, I work in dining services, or, uh, you know, I just wanna find out a little bit about you ask a simple question and go from there. Um, what do you like to eat? What time do you get up in the morning? Um, do you like coffee or tea? Um, and usually once you ask, they'll start to slowly kind of come back with different questions that or answers, I should say, that kind of lead and direct the conversation from there. You know, some people might say, oh, I prefer tea. Oh, what do you take in your tea? Do you like lemon in it? Do you like cream or sugar? Um, you know, no, oh, I, I, I prefer coffee only. Oh, I take two creams, I take two, two sugars, right? And then you kind of build upon that. Um, but that's really what we started to do is just ask people um, because so much of your day uh, is dependent upon kind of those rituals that come with food, right? I get up in the morning and the first thing that I do put on the pot of coffee and get ready, right? I let my dog out and then I have my cup of coffee. I need it to get me started. Um, that's not gonna change in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now. Um, so a lot of them, it's the same thing. They wake up and they want that cup of coffee. So how do you take it? And then having that coffee ready to go for them and knowing that makes them feel special right? Like they, they know enough about me to know that I like coffee and I like one cream and I like one sugar. Yeah. Um, and you're building that relationship between that resident and the staff. Um, and it's, it's easy. Um, again, if you don't want to have it with just one individual resident, um, we can talk about, it says on their convening a food forum, gather some residents on a floor, a space together, wherever you have some room and bring three, four, 10, 20, however you want and ask the same types of questions. What types of things do you like to eat? Do you have complaints with the menus? Um, be prepared because sometimes the complaints can be overwhelming, um, but then really listening to them and then saying, okay, you know what? We can't make all the changes you suggested, but can we try with a couple? Yeah, um, Lynn, Lynn, I love how um, 
when you started convening a food forum, um, one of the things that you really did was you said, how do I make this so that I can respond as a, as a dining leader? Because sometimes like if you get too much, it just gets mired in this, like, well, I, I think the food's too salty or I think the food's not salty enough. So one of the things that I thought you did so masterfully was you really tried to keep things small and to kind of um, really localize the efforts of your food responses and, and dining improvements. So you would work like with one floor or one, um, we, we call them neighborhoods or households. We were really kind of looking to get away from medical language. Um, and you really worked one house at a time. Do you want to talk? And then the other thing is you, you would always bring like a focus on like stories or like a recipe journey. Do you want to like share a, a, an experience that you had with that? Um, well, and definitely starting small is an excellent recommendation because you want to start with some small things that you can achieve and that are going to build success. And then from that success, you can continue to grow it, right? Because again, years ago, we had 475 residents living with us. Um, it was hard to make changes that everybody agreed with. Um, it would be hard if you have 20 residents in a house. Um, because everybody has preferences, you know, my mom made sauce this way, I made sauce for my family this way, right? So there's that. So yeah, but again, when you got those stories, right? Oh, I mean, I, I remember, I, again, that was one of those questions that I would ask them is, how do you make spaghetti sauce, tomato sauce, pasta sauce, whatever it is, right? And I would go around the room and kind of ask them and everybody had a different way about it. Um, some people prefer their sauce sweet. Some prefer it more acidic. Um, some like chunks in there, chunks of tomatoes and chunks of onions and things like that. Some put meat in their really sauce. Um, so there's all those options that are available, but you got to then figure out how do you make that work, right? Because you're not going to make all of them happy at one time. So um, we would try if, say for the spaghetti sauce, for instance, it might be nabbing a few elders who could give you their recipe and working with them to be able to say, okay, let's one-on-one, -on -one, let's make sauce for the floor. We're going to go and we're going to purchase whatever it is you need. Um, again, Rebecca's got on the screen here about um, elder preferences and store. The... Um, uh, there, there's ethnic traditions that come. Um, I had a resident who lived here and um, she wanted borscht, which basically I, I've heard it called blood soup. I've heard, heard it called beet soup, um, but she was pretty insistent that everybody would want it and we should put it on the menu for everybody. Um, and I had to have some serious chats to say, I don't know if that is something that everybody here will want, but to honor you, let's figure out how to make it, right? So worked with the activity staff. Um, we figured out a time and a day, right? So we went to the grocery store and we purchased a small volume of what she needed to make some borscht. She got a stock pot from dining services. There was a stove on the floor and she was able to make it. Um, and then she shared it with her friends that she wanted either to try it or also just people who said, you know, I never had it, I'll give it a whirl. Um, it wasn't nearly as popular as she thought it was going to be. So she had some leftovers, um, but either way it honored her ability to be able to make something that was special and important to her. And it held some traditions for her. Um, and that's, I think some of the things, again, you can't do that on a whole, scale for every resident that you work with, but it made a difference to her. Yeah. Lynn, so um, Beverly commented like dining concerns can sometimes get overwhelming and because they come down to what elders are really trying to express is I, I don't feel like I'm seen and I don't feel like I have any, uh, any control over things that are important to me. And one of the things you did with Food Forum was really from a, from a leadership standpoint, you focused on how do I hear people's stories? And then how do I make those stories come to life in the house that they're living in? Um, and I love that Borscht story. I also wanted to share um, 
the picture of of the of the elders on this page here. So we have some greenhouse homes um, in Alaska, and you would think Alaska, you know, maybe a different experience for elders in long term care, and in some ways it may be. Um, but these women are are Inuits, and they had some really incredible traditions. And because of because of guidelines and regulations, it became a real challenge for the nursing home to figure out how to meet their desires um, to cook their fish in the way that they did it, dry their fish in the way that they did it, um, and stay compliant. So they really had to get creative and kind of think, you know, how do we, you know, how do we meet the needs of sharing stories and sharing traditions and also offer food that's safe to each person? So you've done this, I think, as a dietitian um, by really, if, if someone's making something, it's for them, right? And mm -hmm. then they can share it with their friends if their friends opt to, but it's not like it's it's something that has to be conveyed. Do you have a policy or a practice? Do you, can you think of in your time that we that we've gone through to kind of look about like bringing in food or making your own food? So um, we do have a policy, um, but also it really just goes back to what you were saying. So we're still offering what I'll refer to as like the main entree, right? And then if, you know, a family brings in something and they wanna share it with others, those residents can make that choice for themselves and they can say, you know what? I'm okay with knowing that, you know, Rebecca's family made this, whatever, borscht for me. Um, it didn't come necessarily from a, you know, kitchen that's, I don't want to say sanctioned, but, um, but I can make that choice for myself and I'm okay with that. And that's pretty much how we're able to say, okay, that's their choice, right? Resident choice drives a lot of, um, it allows you to be able to say, you know what, these are people, they've made a decision and this is what happens. So yeah, I, I do, I will look for the policy to see if I can share it with you guys. Um, it might take me a minute to find it, to be honest with you. Yeah, don't find it now, but I, I appreciated that because I was thinking okay. as we were, as, as we were talking, I was like, I know we had this challenge come up. Um, mm -hmm. And, and we, I, I think a lot of the things that you've addressed in your dining leadership has been addressed through resident rights and really looking at autonomy and self-determination um, and then creating practices where people are informed with what the risk could be, but they can make decisions. And um, someone had asked us, Lynn, and I want to acknowledge it, will we talk about diabetic diets? Um, and I know that's a little bit further in our in our group, but do you want to just do you want to talk about your your dietitian lens in terms of diabetic or no added salt or low fat? Um, in terms of diets and what your kind of process has been. Um, I'll laugh. I, I'm smiling as as you're asking because um, Rebecca already knows the answer to this. I'm sure. Um, so I would say for myself personally, I'm. Um, a little bit of a different breed in the dietary community in the sense that um, personally, I've been a diabetic for 31 years now um, and I've never followed a diabetic diet. Um, there are foods that I know may impact my blood sugar um, and I plan accordingly to that, right? But it's not a diet. I don't have, I can't tell you this. I will be the first person that will be the one eating the dessert, the cake, whatever it may be, ice cream before anything else. Um, and so what we've tried to do um, as best we can here is really try to avoid, this is the diabetic diet. We have some general guidelines that we use. Um, so if you, Rebecca gets admitted and she, um, they order some sort of consistent carbohydrate or whatever diet, right? We make some modifications, we call it. We have sugar substitute available. We have diet um, drinks for people. Um, Again, those are the things, uh, sugar-free syrup is available for pancakes, right? So they're there um, should the person choose to use them. Um, it's the same thing with our no added salt. We have the general rule of thumb, no ham, bacon, sausage. Um, and so again, we don't necessarily go out and offer it, but if a resident says, hey, um, and most often those are the people that want the ham, bacon and sausage on the no added salt diet, right? If they're asking, you're gonna give them the, are you sure, you know, there's some other options available? Nope, I want the bacon. Okay, 
that is their choice. Resident choice comes back to it again. Um, and so we really don't have quite the restrictive diets that we used to when I first started here. I mean, we used to have a diet for everything and now we've really just kind of scaled it back to some general guidelines. Yeah, well, that's one of the key themes for this webinar is that when you're looking at dining, oftentimes simplifying things helps to get people to the customization that each of us need within our own preferences. It can be sometimes overwhelming when um, we really try and try and make everyone's needs be met in every meal, but really stripping things down. Lin, um, Linda and I had some really great success with what we might call a liberalized diet plan and really working with our medical team um, from a from an administrator and a diet a, a dietitian and dieting leader standpoint and saying, listen, you know, what's the essence of what we're trying to do here? We're trying to get people to a place where they're eating well and their skin is intact and they feel good. And if those things are happening, we don't have to micromanage um, you know, with some rare exceptions, we don't have to micromanage salt intake or um, sugar and carbohydrates. We actually can really modify through the way that we live lifestyle on the floor. So it requires conversation, it requires care planning, um, but it's really a great vehicle to meet each individual's needs. Uh, Lynn, thank you for addressing that. And we may actually get to talk about it a little bit more. I want to go back for a second um, to talk about kind of thinking through like how, you know, someone had asked like, well, how do you make holidays meaningful for people? And that kind of thing. We'll get to that at the end a little bit um, towards the end of our discussion when we start talking about something Linda and I like to call convivium, which is um, <laughs> food with life essentially. Yep. Um, but I, I want to take a second and just think about um, how as leaders, and I think on, on the call there, you know, we have, I know we have ombudsmen and we have advocates and we have family members, and maybe we have people who are living in long-term care or work in long-term care. So there's a, a really big gamut of people who are listening. And I just want to say a lot of what happens is it comes from casting a vision, right? So you've got to start with this vision of what would the world look like in our home or in our house or on this floor, or maybe it's just if I'm a nurse in, in this small group of people I'm supporting, what would it look like if the elders had access to the food that they wanted all the time um, at the times that they wanted? And then start thinking, how can I get that to happen? And how can I identify those? And when you and I were working on rehab, that was one of the things that we really started together was thinking about like, okay, so we have a tray line that sends food up three times a day, but we have people yep. who want more, right? Um, so do you want to talk about how we went from kind of that strictly tray line kind of run of the mill dining experience to something a bit more customizable and a bit more, maybe even a little bit um, more flexible for the people who are living in our long-term care? So for us, again, this is going back probably, well, 20 years ago for myself. When I started here, they used to have um, a small option of food that was available because we did, we had a tray line that ran, right? So on a floor, what you could find available for somebody off shift evening overnight was basically ice cream. Um, there was usually some applesauce because it was often given with the meds, um, crackers, saltines, and we had peanut butter and jelly so they could make sandwiches. And one of the things that we said was, gosh, at home, when I want a midnight snack or I wake up in the middle of the night or before I go to bed or watching TV, whatever it is, like, what are those things that I would want to snack on? Because it's not saltines, it's not grams. The ice cream, maybe. Um, peanut butter and jelly, I love a good peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but that's not what I always want. So what the question was just pretty much asked, like, what would you snack on in your home? Popcorn came up, chips came up. Um, again, ice cream did come up, but instead of it being a tiny little four ounce Dixie cup that you pulled the little, uh, ours used to be styrofoam and you pulled the little lid off of it, having other options. And they have um, flavored ice cream that was different. Could you put syrup and nuts on it? Those types of things. Um, and we really started to just ask and think about what can we get? Um, 
because if you don't want peanut butter, what else could you have? Can we have the egg salad or the tuna salad or whatever it was? Um, and we would ask residents and we would ask families, what types of things do you want to see? Um, because guess what? They're your customer and they're going to tell you and what I might like may not be what they're looking for. Um, and so we got their input and we slowly started to say, okay, let's, let's have more offerings up there. Um, let's have these, and I'll refer to them as pantries, um, where there's options to have different stuff um, because not everybody wants a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, and so we started to figure out, have those conversations and figure out what they wanted and then how we were gonna get them up to the neighborhood or the households at the time and keep them stocked and make sure that it met the needs. And there were some floors that wanted some things and other floors didn't want that at all. Um, again, we. I think total at the time had 14 or 15 different households. Um, so they each have different individuals living in them. So some wanted more popcorn and less cookies. Some wanted these types of chips. Um, and that's really what we did is we took a look at what was available from our supplier and we said, okay, we're gonna offer this. Um, and we found really a lot of great success with it. Um, yeah. The residents that live with us back then and even now, they're no different than you and I. Um, they love a good barbecued chip. Um, they like flavored sour cream and onion this. Um, you know, I get a, get this all the time and I, I, I unfortunately we're not always able to get it, but I have a resident, he loves Captain Crunch Crunchberry cereal. Like that's what he wants. Um, so we go to the store, um, and we purchase it for him because I can't get that from our supplier, but I can go to Walmart and buy a value size box of it, right? And get it. It's a couple of, well, prices have gone up. So I would say, I used to say it was a couple of dollars. It's probably more like five or six now, but um, it's an easy investment to make for somebody to really be happy and enjoy. And think about what it would feel like if you're living in a place where you've moved in you don't know the people that you're, who are caring for you yet, the people that you're living with, you might even have a roommate, um, right? So you don't know these people, you're moving into a total foreign environment, but how nice is it when you got up that morning or you know, a few weeks after you moved in and that bowl of Captain Crunch with Crunch Berries or Berries is, that's what you want and you have it there to start your day, right? Makes you feel totally different than, oh, here's some eggs. Yeah, Cho choices is so important. And um, again, Lynn, I feel like when when you lead that from whatever role you're in, when you lead with the the experience of I'm looking for how to create choice and flexibility, I think that's when your dining program can really start to become more than just food on a plate in front of people. It starts to become more about who people are and why they are the way they are. And you can help your team kind of know them. You know, you Linda knows I'm a really big fan of um engaging staff beyond nursing staff in meals and um and these neighborhood pantries or a pantry um kind of component has been in different organizations across the nation really successful because uh you know oftentimes we think about the experience of the people living in long-term care and maybe forget the experience of the people working in long-term care and i'm not saying that that is this audience because i suspect you're all pretty well informed but you know here's the scoop we're talking with people who struggle with food insecurity all the time sometimes housing insecurity and we're asking them to take care of frail elders who need really flexible and dynamic compassion day in and day out. So sometimes organizations that lead with lead, lead with flexible and dynamic compassion for their care team members um, get a really unique experience. And it doesn't have to be just for team members. It can be for both. So I love the idea of a sharing pantry um, and a really welcoming staff to share snacks alongside. And Linda started um, when we were working together, she started working on um, policy where if staff were using food as a path to connection, so if you were sharing a cup of hot chocolate, or if you were having um, a bag of popcorn, or maybe um, maybe baking cookies, if you were if you were eating those together, you're welcome to eat all in any of the food that we offer as an organization. So it just became kind of an accepted practice that people would eat together um, and and really connect together. Um, 
The other thing is really getting to think about for your non CNA and nursing staff, um, food break culture or meal break culture. So if all the people who work in the, the nursing home alongside of you take their lunch break at between 1130 and one, it's really actually stripping your organization of a huge resource that you have to support a really beautiful lunch experience. And for the, um, the, the astute person who said, well, what happens if you don't have a lot of family? How do we make a meaningful meal experience? One of the things Linda and I did together um, is we really worked with, with really connecting non-clinical staff with elder spaces. So we, again, we called them houses um, to have that group of staff, either they were billing or they were, again, um, maybe not necessarily people who were connected to the floors, but connecting them to the floors and then starting to welcome them through programming. So if activities was doing, um, let's say a strawberry social, we would invite the facilities group and the billing group and everyone would kind of eat and connect together. We would introduce a few people, start to create some relationships. And that's where those holidays and those special events start to mean something because they happen in relationship. Um, and that's really the, the trick to kind of meaningful meals in some way is creating that sense of relationship, isn't it, Lynn? Like we're 100%. really looking for how do we get people to connect? And Lynn and I were talking in, pre in preparation for this um, webinar and we were like, you know, the, especially post pandemic with masks on, we've lost the art of conversation. Um, and we've, we've, we've kind of gotten away from that for other reasons, but, um, so Linda and I were kind of talking about like, not everyone is a great chatter. Lynn, we can talk about anything for hours, especially when it comes to long -term care. I, I can chat away to whomever and talk to myself in the corner and be happy as a clam. But many people are not comfortable just going up and going, hi, how are you? I'm so-and-so. Yeah. So planting someone who has that natural skill with others just to kind of role model it is, is really critical. Um, and then in really looking at your 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 culture of meal breaks, right? So what's the policy around meal breaks and how do you create a culture that, you know, if you want a meal break by yourself, you're, of course, you're welcome to it and we want you to take it, but we want to do it after we've made sure that the people who live here have a meaningful meal and figuring out how to do that within your organization is a really great starting point. And again, um, just kind of coming back to our food forum topic, like we always want to, I, I always recommend you start really small, right? Um, find a couple of champions in the organization and start with a small group and really start to work out some of the kinks um, to create meaningful meals and accessible meals um, so that you can start to get to a place where people have deep relationships and see, oh, it's not that the food is bad. It's that I'm lonely. And let's talk about that crux of the issue because bad food can work when you're in a good relationship and you're having a good time. Um, but if you're bad food and you're lonely, it's no good. Someone asked Linda about, um, kind of sounds like a big organization and struggling with food getting cold all the time. What are some strategies that we've used to keep food warm? Do you want to talk to that a little bit? Ooh. <clears throat> So um, I would say that we, I, I don't want to sound like we are this magical little place where everything goes beautiful. So we too struggle with that as well. Um, we have on our, all of our floors, they have their own kind of, I'm going to call it an individual kitchen. Um, they're not preparing food up there. I mean, there's opportunity to do, but the main food is still cooked in our kitchen downstairs and sent up. But we have steam wells on each of our households. Um, most have two, some have three, depending on size. Um, and so the food is cooked in, um, in bulk and, and panned up and sent upstairs. And then the steam wells help to keep it cold or warm, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I will say that it requires a lot of um, reminders to staff um, because I'm sure everybody is in the same boat with staffing shortages. Um, it's reminding them that you can't plate up food for 10 people and put it on a cart and then start to deliver it around because the first person getting it is gonna get warm food. The 10th person getting it is gonna get cold food. So making sure you're utilizing the steam well and you're only plating one or two dishes and then bringing it up. Again, with Rebecca's previous slide that we had up, that just is another example of where people who don't 
necessarily work up on that household or that neighborhood or whatever it is you call it, right? They can still come up and be helpful um, and still enjoy the meal and have those conversations, but they can help serve food, pass drinks, start conversation, because you are going to have some people who are great at having those talks, and you're going to have others who it's, I don't want to say awkward or uncomfortable, but they're just not as good at it. Um, but you can allow them to then see somebody else who is, and slowly you'll, they'll start to come out of their shell, but they can come up and help so that it's not one or two aides taking care of 20 people and having to get that food to them. So um, I think the steam wells were a huge help for us and continue to be. Um, again, sometimes we have to remind staff that they need to be utilized all the time, so. The, the other thing that helps with um, food temps is, is not plating it in a central place and that's kind of what the steam walls are, but, but actually family style experiences. And Lynn, um, you're, you're so good at this because, you know, people kind of get caught up in, in the family style experience because they're like, yes, but you know, my family member is pureed and mine is dental soft ground and mine is, you know, my family member doesn't like to, ha doesn't like this kind of thing, but, but family style doesn't mean everyone gets what we're having. It actually means it comes in real, again, your team members know people. What are, what are some of the ways though, that we've, um, we, we've had success helping to support people who have modified diets for consistency, either for swallowing needs or things like that. Even with a snack pantry, thinking through that, like, have we ever had someone who really wants a certain snack, but they've got a modified diet and we've had to kind of be creative on how to meet their, meet their desires? Um, so some of it is, um, I, I feel like we do a little bit more of a case by case basis with folks like that. Um, just because they tend to be more the minority than the majority. Um, and so it's figuring out what snacks are they looking for? And then can we modify, right? So again, ice cream is typically one of those items that most people can have. Um, we do have the, um, here we call them magic cups. I don't know if it's a brand everybody else is, uses, but um, they're, a, um, for those on thick and liquids, um, those kind of cover that. But, um, it's really taking a look like, can we take a piece of cake that comes in for somebody's birthday and can we still give them the cake, but we soak it in some milk and maybe cut it into, you know, mush it down a little bit. So they're still getting that item, um, but it's still meeting their mechanically altered needs. Um, it's so funny. Again, there's, a, there's just, it's, it's really, like I said, I, I, I'm trying to come up with some examples of things that we've tried in the past. Um, Do you remember Lynn? What, uh, well, one of the things that you, you had kind of mentioned here is um, getting floors, simple tools like blenders um, yeah. and uh, toaster, like just simple things so that actually whatever they're eating, they can try to, mod and, and, and training is a big thing, right? You have to train people how to modify how things. How to do it. Yep. But um. But I remember when we were learning, this is such a, this is such a rocky story. I wonder if you remember it too. We had someone who needed a pureed diet and we really literally tried to puree everything so that there was no, like, so that it was seamless and people could really have what everyone else was having. Um, and someone tried to puree salad. Do you remember that? It was, Bigly, not, yes. it was not pretty. So salad doesn't puree. It's just, it doesn't work that way. Um, so then but, but that, I, rem I remember the elder was literally like, I, I would really like salad. And we were like, okay, so what about salad do you like? Well, I love Italian dressing. Okay. And I love croutons. Croutons give you that crunch and with puree, you can't get that crunch. And I was like, okay, so what else? So what ended up, what ended up happening was I feel like they took um, carrots and Italian dressing and maybe some like, th this is where like culinary creativity happens. Yep. Um, some cold veggies that taste good, cold broccoli, carrots, um, and putting Italian dressing in them, not a ton, just enough for that kind of salad experience. And then um, that was something that was really enjoyable to them. The, the appearance of puree food is gonna be an ongoing challenge. And someone asked this question in the, in the questions. They said, you know, how do you make pureed food desirable? And I know Lynn, you've done a lot. Um, I mean, I think we tried molds at some points. Um, I was gonna say, we've tried a number of things. And um, we did do molds, they... We're hitting this, right? I was just gonna say, um, 
So I think one of the big things that I try to push, push, push for with anybody who's on a pureed diet is, did you put the condiments on whatever it is they're consuming, right? So I feel like a lot of times you have the vegetables, a great example, the green beans, the peas, whatever it is, right? It just becomes green. Um, you can't tell what it is. Um, but when you plate that, did you season it? Did you put butter on it? Um, because a lot of times, uh, for us at least, I try our pureed food regularly, A, to make sure it's meeting the standard, but also does it taste good, right? When I have green beans, I don't eat plain green beans. I put butter on them. I put some Parmesan cheese on mine, salt and pepper, right? Different people have different things that they prefer. Um, I always joke, my husband will have a bottle of sriracha in the nursing home um, because he likes everything spicy. Um, he likes it to have heat. So add a little, um, again, they might not be into sriracha, but they certainly can have the butter, the Parmesan cheese, gravy on things. Um, we do have a molded, it's a hot dog and it, it looks like a banana that you split in half type thing. But I say to them, put ketchup and mustard on it. When you have a hot dog, you put stuff on it. Um, so making sure that you're flavoring it. You might not make it, be able to make it look beautiful, but once they taste a bite of it, if it tastes good, they're gonna want more of it. Um, again, you can play around with different molds and different things and, and making um, mixes of stuff. Um, but if the flavor's there, people will eat it. And the temperature, I think, is important. Yep, and, and hot. I was going to say yeah. it makes a world of difference when you, because if you think about it, when you're home and you make something and it comes out and it's not warm enough, right? You either put it back in the oven or you microwave it up a little bit. Um, they're no different. So they want to make sure it's hot and it has some flavor. Yeah. Lynn, I can't believe how fast 45 minutes goes with you. I, I oh. love talking to you. I, we could talk about food nonstop, but, um, but I, um, I want to make sure I address some of the questions and then we'll f formally turn it over to questions and answers. Um, somebody asked about, so a couple of people have asked about pureed food or, um, how, how do you make it look appetizing? So you gave some great recommendations. I would also say like one of the things I think was has been really successful in places I've seen across the nation is that if they normalize puree foods as a part of the dot of the of the main of the main um, menu. So if if everyone is getting a cauliflower puree soup, it doesn't make me feel like I'm not part of what everyone else is experiencing. It's plated the same for everyone. And, and really like squash purees and cauliflower purees and whole foods in puree form are probably the most delightful and they're not that expensive. And if you can get that into your menu cycle, it starts to bring it. Someone else asked about what about healthy foods? You know, um, Linda is not, a, she's definitely not a granola crunchy health nut, uh, but I, I, I've found great healing through healthy foods and through whole foods. Um, so I'm always like, I want to make sure that I can get my vegetables when I, when I, um, when I need long-term care someday, I would likely will, right? Many of us will. Um, and my husband always laughs. He, he says, I, I ask for nothing usually, except for I need vegetables and I need vegetables that taste good and that feel good. So I think if you are offering those in fun ways to people through soups or through, um, fun cuts, you know, that have different looks, uh, you really start to get people in, in their bright colors, you get to start get start to get people interested in them. So I think those are ways you can affordably bring whole foods in. Um, and Lynn has also had great success using whole foods for supplements, really packing smoothies full of things. So for people who are on puree yeah. diets, maybe the meal experience doesn't feel as great, but maybe having a smoothie that's protein packed or, you know, chia rich, or it's got lots of great, um, um, great things in it. it. It entices you and it feels special. And you can do that two or three times a day. It starts to kind of build in the practice of eating and swallowing and getting nutrition, maybe enough to build at some point um, a different a different diet or, or, or maybe not. Um, so I think- One of the other things we tried real quick, Becca, yeah. I just want to interrupt. Um, we tried piping a bunch of the pureed food. Um, Pasta, for instance, we put it in a piping bag and kind of piped it so it looked like spaghetti, um, kind of swirled onto the plate and then put the sauce on top of it. Um, 
we found some success in that. Uh, what I will say is it's a little bit more time consuming to be able to do that, but it's feasible. Um, and again, sometimes you have somebody who will eat better because it looks like what it is. Um, you can buy molded pureed food that's already done um, and you're just heating it and putting it on the plate for them. Um, and some of them are very tasty. Um, you can always season and add to it. But like I said, we did find some of the things with piping worked really well. Yeah, thanks. Um, Lynn, will you also talk to like how we do kosher, how you've had success with kosher and halal or specialized food? I'll, I'll give, before I turn it over to you, I'll, I'll tell you something that's been really cool that I just saw um, at an organization in Louisiana, actually. They've contracted with... Um, restaurant providers that specialize in those foods and they actually cater in for their elders that have those specialized needs, which is kind of unique because those elders can actually like in that day, make that selection and then they just grub hub it in. I think that's really innovative and a cool use of technology to meet individual elders needs. I'm not sure how it would link with the dietitian though, but so that was just something I wanted to plug in there. So if you are truly, truly kosher, then you are supposed to have separate stuff for, um, I believe it's dairy doesn't mix with the meat is how it plays down. Um, but yes, we have actually, um, we're finding not so much, I shouldn't say not that it isn't happening with kosher food, but we're noticing like gluten-free has become kind of the newer thing that people are coming in with specialty or um, they're vegans and they're coming in and we didn't used to have that, right? It was a rarity, but now they're becoming more popular. So I found honestly, our food supplier has, they've really expanded their offerings for a bunch of those things. Um, you will find some things that are kosher as well. Um, but again, reaching out, we've tried local grocery stores to see if we can get stuff. We do what we can to try to accommodate. Um, again, I had a resident requesting for lactose-free ice cream recently, um, and I just, I couldn't get it from our supplier. Um, so I went to the local grocery store and bought a couple half gallons, and when she needs a refill, they let me know, and I go and get it for her. Um, it's easier, and honestly, buying it in that smaller size is way better because, if I'm going to get it from our supplier, we're going to get a three gallon tub, which, you know, that's going to be hard to go through. So. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Lynn, a couple more questions. We'll go straight to Q&A, but I wanted to just give a shout out to the ombudsman from Florida who made a comment about um, the artifacts of culture change. So Linda and I are both certified Eden Associates. I work for the Greenhouse Project. We're huge proponents of demedicalizing the industry um, and really, really creating home. And so I want to thank you for pointing people to that artifacts of culture change. Certainly email me if you're interested in learning more about that. It is a great inventory to really think about what are the things that give us as human beings meaning and how can we start to imbue our homes no matter how big or small they are or what they look like with those pieces of, of meaningful life. Um, so please reach out to me. Um, a lot of the work that we've done has come through those influences. So we appreciate that you brought, I appreciate that you brought that up. Someone asked Lynn, do you have suggestions for big organizations with one central kitchen to integrate more of a family style experience. Uh, the first thing that I can think of is start small, right? Start yep. one entity at a time. But I mean, you had a tray line for 500 people and you dismantled that tray line. Uh, <laughs> what were some of the things you learned through that? And what would you recommend to thinking about how do I get to a more family style within that complex of we have one kitchen, maybe not lots of kitchens? So um, definitely starting small, um, maybe you pick a one floor that you're going to pilot some programs on, right? Um, see what works, see what may be an option. Um, we did, a, before we made any big changes, um, I remember Rebecca as our administrator and kind of culture change guru at the time meeting with the dining team. So I brought in um, not just myself, but the other managers and supervisors. And we literally had papers on walls and she brainstormed, you know, like just think of ways you can get the food up to the floor without having that traditional big 
cart that held 40 trays, right? Like, so how do you get food up there? And how, and we at the time um, were somewhat limited, right? Because again, nobody has unending funds. Um, so figuring out how to do it in a relatively inexpensive way that worked. We certainly tried some things that did not work. Um, one thing I will tell you that we never ever thought about until after the fact um, was garbage. Um, and I know it sounds stupid, but we used to have all the food come from the kitchen and go upstairs and then all of it came back downstairs and all the garbage was in the kitchen. And when we moved to bringing it upstairs, we didn't take into account that now the garbages on the neighborhoods were gonna see far more stuff going in them. Um, and so what we found after a little while was some of our environmental services staff going out with back injuries um, because they were lifting these garbages that were filled to the brim with stuff. Um, we also saw some injuries from plates they fell, they broke, and they would throw them in the garbage instead of making sure that the sharp edges, so somebody had gotten a cut. We totally didn't plan for that to happen. So we had probably 12 garbage cans downstairs that just sat there empty, and we had not enough upstairs. So we had to meet with the S and figure out, like, they have to change more often. It can't just be a one a day, you know, before the end of the day the day shift goes home, right? They need it changed after breakfast. They need it changed after lunch. Um, but again, start small and make some small changes. I always say, pick a few things and then build upon that. When you have success, people will buy into the changes that you wanna make when they see that some of the things you've brought forward work. Um, if you try a bunch of things and they're just, flailing, then they're never going to buy into you doing something else. So hundred percent, hundred percent, Lynn. So um, Mr. Campbell, Donald Campbell asked a question about helping people eat who, who also have visual impairment. And actually, I think um, this question might answer a couple of the, uh, the questions, but how do you help people eat? Or what do you do when, you know, you, you're constantly bringing up the same things, but you're not feeling like there's any effort to shift things. And I got to tell you, for me, those things come back really to, to investment and training. And I think it's training and in in training staff in a way where we get to experience what's happening. So um, I know that there are some great um, embodied labs and some great places that do like real time training for people who struggle with, who have visual impairment or they have maybe dementia that can affect your visual plane and your sensory um, inputs. Um, but really thinking about, and for the person who said, you know, our food counselor, our family council brings up great ideas and, um, and, um, it just is met with, well, this is what we've been doing and this is what we, this is how we do it. Um, and it feels like things are, aren't heard. Uh, it's a really frustrating experience. So in some ways, what I think you're getting met with is people, people who feel like they can't fix what you're asking them to fix, even with your suggestions. They don't feel like they have the empowerment or tools or resources or capacity to implement the things that you're suggesting. So maybe sometimes, um, one of the one of the places to start with is can you experience can you share a meal with us um, can you just come and share a meal with us and not in an adversarial way right we're all Linda and I know this so deeply like we are all trying so hard to make long term care a meaningful experience for people in a compliant way with with you know our surveillance teams and at, at and great. Rights a great challenge, a great challenge because staffing is challenging. The external message of long-term care is challenging. So to come at people um, and say like, hey, can you come alongside of me for a minute? And then let's and really come with, can we brainstorm? Can we brainstorm something small that may be possible? Um, then then providers, you know, I know as myself when I was chief operating officer and for Linda, sometimes we felt like, gosh, we wish we could do something, but we just don't feel like we have capacity right now. And to say that takes a, a lot of courage, but it also takes a, a amount of awareness of who you are. And you can say things like that safer when you're actually working in relationship with people. So I would just continue for Mr. Campbell um, to help people eat. You have to do it in relationship context and to get people to think about 
trying new things, you have to start to, to do that in relationship context. So it does take time and that can be really frustrating. I also think long-term uh, long care ombudsmans are huge resources for organizations. Um, they oftentimes know how to frame things or can bring tools like that amazing person from Florida um, just to start the conversation and crack open the door a little bit to say, hey, you know what? 16 years of doing things one way may mean that it's time for us to start looking at something else. And again, Lynn and I kind of say, start small, start small, start small. Um, I want to thank you all so much. I'm sorry we didn't get to every comp, uh, every question and every comment. Linda's and I contact information is in the chat. Um, and you're yep. welcome to email us individually. We're happy to engage. And Richard and team, thank you for the opportunity today. Yeah, thank you so much. Any questions that we didn't answer, please reach out. I have no, I, I welcome being able to answer anything. Uh, Linda and, and Rebecca, thank you so much. I, I just thought it, it was a lot of, I hate to say, food for thought in your, in your presentation. <laughs> um, but really, there, there was, and I've been doing this for a lot of years, there certainly was for me. Um, I think you got at a lot of the um, questions, like the, there were a few about the practicality and overcoming the kind of inertia and the uh, I, and, and the um, uh, sense that the administration or, or leadership in a facility may not want to change. They've been doing something for 5, 10, 16, you know, 20 years or more. Um, I love the idea. I wrote it down looking at my, at my notes. Can you share a meal with us? And I think that's a really... Um, interesting and thoughtful way of of approaching uh, of approaching this issue. Uh, so so thank you very much. Thanks for sharing your contact information. And uh, it is challenging, as I always say to people in anything we do. You know, change is challenging. It's very hard in, in the nursing home uh, and assisted living industry, especially. There's there tends to be some some kind of inertia. But I think that um, by pushing by broadening our, our expectations and how they can be met, it's um, it's very helpful. And, and you've done all that today. Um, before we uh, close, I just want to mention, please save the date for our next monthly webinar. It'll be January 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern. We um, are arranging a, a very interesting speaker. Can't announce it yet, but I hope that you will join us and save the date. Uh, one last plug, this is the time of our annual appeal, so if you're able to donate, uh, any amount is appreciated and goes directly towards our, um, uh, our mission. Uh, for materials from today's webinar, please visit nursinghome411.org forward slash webinar dash food. Uh, we have a new report that came out today, a decade of drugging that focuses on the last 10 years of, of the use of antipsychotic drugs in nursing homes, it's nursinghome411.org forward slash decade dash drugs. Uh, and as I mentioned, our annual um, appeal, nursinghome411.org forward slash donate. Any amount, again, is appreciated. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us today. And again, to our wonderful speakers, we, we really appreciate it. Have a, nice, uh, have a nice holiday season, everybody, and new year. <laughs>